The vampire is the most fascinating and fearsome of all movie characters. A pale-skinned, immortal monster with an aversion to daylight and a desire for blood. A terrifying being that can surely only live in fantasy. But one man has discovered that vampires don't just exist in the movies. Michael Bell has been on the trail of these vampires for 20 years. I think the evidence is incontrovertible that there were vampires in New England. I found documentation of every sort, newspaper articles from eyewitnesses, their diary entries, uh, journal entries, and local town histories. And he's close to uncovering the real origin of this terrifying legend. For most of us, the hunt for the vampire starts here, in Transylvania, beyond the forests of Romania, the mysterious homeland of the ultimate bloodsucker, Dracula. Transylvania is the place to come to find out. Is it true or is it not true about this vampire? Transylvania has become the vampire capital of the world only thanks to an Irishman, Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula in 1897. And from that time forward, when someone said Transylvania, the first association was Count Dracula or a vampire. Bram Stoker's Dracula is one of the most chilling stories ever created. It's the frightening tale of an immortal vampire with a nocturnal lust for blood. It's been retold on the silver screens hundreds of times and has shaped our image of what a vampire is. But where did Bram Stoker get his inspiration? Everybody that reads that novel or sees those movies says, oh, Bram Stoker had a wild imagination. No, he really didn't have much of an imagination at all. He just took authentic folklore and he incorporated it into his novel. The parasitic villain in the story was given the name of a real prince who ruled this area in the Middle Ages. Vlad Dracula was a powerful warrior leader with a bit of a reputation. The historical Dracula was a horror figure in his own lifetime because of his fondness for a peculiar form of execution called impalement. And he used to dine amid his impaled victims and take bread and dip it in the bowls of blood that were on the dinner table in front of him. But he was not a vampire. Bram Stoker took the name Dracula from history, but the blood-sucking undead vampire he took from local folklore, a folklore that wasn't unique to this part of the world. Folklore around the world has stories of revenants, that is, the, this sort of returning um, animated corpse that go back to the ancient Greeks. There are legends in China, but it's the same story. It's these people who are dead are suddenly undead and able to harm the living. Vampire stories exist in every time and place. So American folklorist Michael Bell is convinced the legend must be based on something real. He's scouring the historical archives, seeking clues to what that something really is. The evidence is that between, say, 1790 and the 1890s, there were many, many, many cases of exhuming people, uh, thinking that perhaps they were causing the death of family members, that they were, in fact, vampires. Surprisingly, evidence for Bell has been easy to come by. In this part of the world, the vampire was still around just over a hundred years ago, so all its activities are recorded in the local newspapers. They paint an illuminating picture. Folk vampires are not your good-looking, pale, well-dressed, aristocratic people. The folk vampires are basically disgusting, bloody, bloated corpses. Somehow they are a spirit inhabiting the body of one of your former kin. And that spirit, that evil, is sapping the life out of the family members. From his research, Bell has pieced together the typical events that would result in a vampire slaying. 
The last of these macabre rituals took place in the small Rhode Island town of Exeter in 1892. The body that was identified as a vampire was that of Mercy Brown, a 19-year-old girl, really, a young woman who had died. And her mother and her sister had also died previously. And then her brother, Edwin, got ill. The people of Exeter began to panic. They were sure a vampire was at work. And after it had sucked life from all the Browns, it would move on to them. A delegation came to see Edwin's father. George. So they said, look, you've got to do something. Maybe you can save Edwin. And at least maybe you can stop it with Edwin and it won't continue out and kill people in the community. On March the 17th, villagers gathered at the cemetery. There was only one way to save Edwin Brown and the whole community. They would dig up his dead family and find which one was the vampire. This wasn't peasants with lighted torches sneaking around. They seemed to have done it in full daylight with everyone's knowledge, walked right past houses and churches into cemeteries and exhumed several bodies. The local newspaper, the Providence Journal, reported the true horror of what they were up to that day. The bodies were to be dug up to ascertain if the heart in any of the bodies still contained blood. As these friends were fully convinced that if such were the case, the dead body was living on the tissue and blood of Edwin. The mother and daughter were basically skeletons. Mercy looked relatively fresh, so people at the scene said, this is the one. <gasps> so they cut her heart out found that it did indeed have liquid blood, which was interpreted as fresh blood, perhaps Edwin's, and they took it to a nearby rock and burned it to ashes. Then, in a desperate attempt at a cure for poor Edwin, they took the burnt ashes of Mercy's heart and created a concoction, which they fed to him. Unfortunately, he died two months later. But according to the family story, that took care of the problem because no one else died. And George Brown, indeed, the father, lived for another 30 years. Michael has pieced together over 20 vampire accounts. The startling similarities, he believes, show a pattern that points to the real origin of the vampire story, a disease with particular symptoms that people in an age before modern medicine wove into this terrifying myth. But what disease could it be? In the Spanish port of Vigo, Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso thinks he has the answer. He's the chief neurologist at the city's general hospital and an expert on diseases of the nervous system. Neurology deals with epilepsy, brain tumors, dementias, Parkinson's disease, and rabies. One evening, when Juan Gomez was watching a vampire movie, he had a brainwave. I had the impression that the vampire film was more or less a theatrical representation of disease or rabies. Rabies is an infectious disease that attacks the primitive part of our brains, the limbic system, the part responsible for our basic drives, hunger, thirst, sex, fear. Gomez could see that the vampires in the movies showed many of the characteristics of this disease. Such as a marked uh, aggressiveness, an increased sexual drive, the intolerance to stimuli such as smells or mirrors. But what about the vampire's hunger for the night time? The same thing occurs in rabies because rabid patients and animals with furious rabies tend to develop insomnia. Let me kiss you. 
There was one final detail that for Gomez confirmed the link between rabies and vampires. The bite. There is also another coincidence, which is that in both vampirism and rabies, they are transmitted through a bite. But Dr. Gomez needed more concrete evidence than just what he'd seen in the movies. He searched the archives of Europe, hunting for a correlation between outbreaks of rabies and reports of vampire attacks. His hunch was right. In 18th century Eastern Europe, at least, there was a perfect match between reports of vampires and epidemics of rabies. And yet vampire stories come from every time and place not just when rabies is epidemic. Could Gomez have been misled by the movie image of the vampire? People have tied this vampire matter with outbreaks of rabies. <laughs> Symptoms of rabies are completely different. I mean, you're foaming at the mouth and that sort of thing. There's, none of that happens as far as the folklore goes with the vampire. It's not the way you see it in the movie. <laughs> None of the vampires Michael Bell has documented were sexy creatures with fangs and a fear of mirrors and strong smells. But he was still sure that disease would unlock the vampire mystery. If not rabies, what could it be? Michael knew that he would unearth the truth only when he could find a real vampire body. One cold November day, he got that body. A century ago, the villages of New England were haunted by a genuine fear of vampires. Folklorist Michael Bell is trying to uncover the roots of that fear. He's pieced together the details of 20 cases and believes a pattern can be seen that may finally bring the real vampire out into the light. The case here is typical of those that happened in New England. This is the Tillingcast family. The oldest was Sarah and she was the first to die. And after that, several other of the children got sick and started dying. But there was something different about the way the last six had died. They complained that Sarah had come back during the night and put pressure on various parts of their bodies. These nightmares gave a crucial clue to Bell in his search for the disease that would explain the vampire legend. The transmission of the legend is all about nightmares. The victims complain of being visited by this apparition of this relative of theirs who has died, who is choking the life out of them. <laughs> and they almost always say, oh no, it's mercy, or oh no, Sarah comes and sits on me at night. And they wake up unable to breathe, choking and coughing. Waking up, perhaps coughing up blood, so you might have blood on your nightshirt. So it's like something is coming at night and draining the blood out of this person. You can see the evidence right before your eyes. The farmers of New England thought they were being visited by a supernatural being. But Michael Bell believes all the clues point to a single explanation, a killer disease little understood at the time. Your body is being consumed by some unseen and unknown force. So day after day, you become weaker, weaker, paler, paler. One disease fits these symptoms perfectly, TB. But Bell's conviction was entirely based on family records in historical archives. He needed physical evidence to support the theory. Then one November morning, the last piece of the grisly jigsaw rolled into place. Two young kids were sliding down the slope of a sand and gravel pit, and they were just sliding down, having a good old time. Well, one slide down, two skulls dislodged and rolled out with them. And of course, the boys freaked right out, you know? When the police first investigated the site, they thought it might be uh, the possibility of a, a serial killer. However, when we examined the skeletal remains, we could see that they were old. 
the boys had uncovered a graveyard dating back 200 years. Over the next three months, 28 bodies were excavated from the site. It was a routine excavation until they discovered a coffin marked with the initials JB. When we encountered JB, he had been rearranged. The femurs or thigh bones had been taken up from their anatomical position and had been crossed over the chest area. Also, some of the ribs had been broken into and the skull had been taken from its anatomical position, rotated and placed on the chest, actually to face the opposite way it should be. And what it gave us was the impression of a, a crossbone and skulls motif. For Michael Bell, only one kind of body would be desecrated in this way, a vampire. Here was the chance to prove his speculation that the origins of the vampire legend in New England lay in the disease tuberculosis. The bones were sent to forensic anthropologist Paul Sledzik in Washington, D.C. When we analyzed J.B.'s skeleton, he showed us a few unique things. He had a lesion or an infection, actually, of his left leg. But of particular interest within the ribs were the fact that we could distinguish uh, that he had tuberculosis at the time of his death. How much more evidence do you need now that you have the physical evidence, the body, to go along with the eyewitnesses, the family stories, the newspaper accounts, the local histories, the diaries? A cure for TB was only discovered 50 years ago. In the past, when one person in a family caught this highly contagious disease, they all might, and then would die pale, gasping for air and coughing blood. No wonder people assumed something supernatural was sucking their life from them. I think the vampire practice was a folk medical practice. People didn't understand contagion the way we understand it now as being caused by some sort of a, a small germ or bacterium or virus. And so they would go to the cemeteries and look for answers. And when they went digging for their vampire, they would see clear signs that fed their superstitions. And of course, the freshest body that they would find would be the one that's the vampire, because of course that's the one that's living off the life forces. They would look for several signs. They would look for what they described as ruddy or rosy cheeks. They would look for fingernails growing after death, uh, hair growing, sometimes blood around the mouth. And then lastly, they would plunge a knife into the heart, and if there was blood in the heart, they would say, there's our vampire. And then they would cut out the heart and burn it. These vampire slayers from history had little knowledge of science or what happens to our bodies when we die. William C. Rodriguez is a forensic anthropologist. He spends his working day picking over the remains of dead bodies. It's only recent that we've really learned about human decomposition and we can explain all the changes that have occurred to that body because it is a biological process. We know quite a bit about this today through our study in forensic pathology. Newspapers of the day took ghoulish delight in reporting the gory details of exhumed vampires. The vampire's fingernails, hair, and beard had continued to grow. But the signs they took to identify a vampire means something quite different to a pathologist today. This is just a simple post-mortem uh, change. What occurs is that as the tissues begin to dry and dehydrate, they pull away from the nail beds and from the follicles, therefore giving the appearance that the nails become very elongated and the hair and the beard continues to grow. The body was bloated and the face flushed and ruddy. What occurs is that as the bacterial activity within the body gives off various types of gases, and these gases build up in the chest and abdomen, causing it to raise, and it gives the appearance that that individual may have had a very heavy meal, uh, whether it be of regular food or even blood. There was fresh blood at the mouth, which she had sucked from the people she'd killed. In the bloating effect, Bloody fluids are purged under gaseous pressure from the mouth, and it gives the appearance that they just fed on a meal of blood. And since they saw that he was a true vampire, 
They drove a stake through his heart, whereby he gave an audible groan. After death, the body still contains trapped air within the lungs, uh, within the areas of the diaphragm, the abdomen. And any type of pressure, certainly something that's a stake uh, being uh, driven through the, the abdominal area of the heart, will actually cause an expelling of the gas. And of course, this over the vocal cords, you can get everything from a gurgling or grunting and, and something that may have in mythology but perceived something as a, as a scream. Belief in vampires dwindled around the turn of the 20th century when more and more people began to understand how disease was spread. Once tuberculosis was known to be a disease that was caused by a germ, then no matter how backwards your family might be, they were unlikely to still believe it was caused by Aunt Mary coming back from the grave. But somehow the evil blood-sucking monster continues to haunt our innermost fears and superstitions. You would think in a scientific universe where we explain so many things, that this would die, this belief would go away. But it doesn't go away. All of us seem fascinated with evil characters because it's a way of stretching your mind and thinking the unthinkable. We still have superstitions today. The reason that someone would still write rest in peace on a gravestone has something to do with the thought that maybe they will come back. Maybe they won't rest in peace. Vampires will be with us always.